Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we are continuing our Cao Cao Let's Talk Lore series with episode 2 of Act 1, titled Cao Cao the Troublemaker. Previously, in our last episode, we covered that Cao Cao was born in the year 155 in Chao Xian, as the firstborn son to Cao Song, and as with most firstborn sons in Chinese families, whether in the past or in present, Cao Cao's birth was celebrated especially since his father Cao Song was ready in his late 20s. Hoping his son would grow up healthy, Cao Song would go on to nickname his newborn Ji Li, which means auspicious or lucky. But this nickname didn't stick for long, as Cao Cao grew up quite the troublemaker at home. And before long, his family already had a new nickname ready for him, called Aman. Now this is the nickname that most of us are familiar with, as it is featured both in the Romance of Three Kingdoms, and the records of the Three Kingdom. And speaking of the romance of the Three Kingdom, let's actually revisit the book right now and take a look at how Cao Cao was first introduced in chapter 1. I'll be reading the Chinese version and providing the English translations on screen before returning to highlight some of the important parts. So in chapter 1, Cao Cao makes his first appearance as the lieutenant of the cavalry as he comes to the aid of Huang Fu Song during the Yellow Turban Rebellion. And in the book, it says, Vei 超幼时,好游猎,喜歌舞,有权谋,多机变 And right off the bat, we can spot the misinformation about Cao Song being a member of the Xiaohou clan, which we dispelled in our first episode. But since that was actually the accepted historical version during the time when Romance of Three Kingdoms was being written, we can't really fault it for using historical sources, as those same historical sources has been proven wrong after a recent DNA test. Now what is more relevant for our discussion of Cao Cao's youth is the depiction that follows. First, it states that he favored hiking and hunting, which actually indirectly implies that he did not like to stay home and read and write, as getting that type of traditional Confucius education was quite common for someone of Cao Cao's status as his family was quite wealthy and involved in government. But Cao Cao, as we know, did acquire quite the talent for poetry and calligraphy, but those were definitely acquired later on in life, as he was definitely the busybody in his youth. Then it continues to reinforce this idea that Cao Cao was not the studious homebody by pointing out that he also liked music and dancing. And given Cao Cao's proclivities for singing his poems and dancing during feast after a few drinks, such as the one he hosted before the Battle of Chibi, and the fact that his favorite concubine, Lady Bian, was actually a dancer before he married her. So I think it's fair to say that Cao Cao was both a practitioner and an admirer of the arts in regards to singing and dancing. But aside from these hobbies and hints that Cao Cao was not studious, the depiction does end with two statements about Cao Cao's wit and cunning, as it states that Cao Cao had a mind for politics and strategies, and was flexible enough to adapt to changing circumstances. And these praises were supported by one of the most well-known stories from Cao Cao's childhood, which is also the story that most modern readers misquote as the reason for why Cao Cao's nickname ended up being Aman. So the story here goes that when Cao Cao was young, he did not like to study, as he spent his time playing with other kids around the capital or hiking and hunting in the outskirts of Luoyang. Cao Cao's own father, Cao Song at this time, did not have any time to pay attention to his own son, as his own political career was on the rise. So Cao Song mainly spent his time networking with the upper echelons of the imperial court, greasing the wheel of the bureaucracy. However, Cao Cao's uncle did care, as he watched the young Cao Cao waste away his life. So Cao Cao's uncle went to Cao Song to warn him about his son's behavior. Now, I don't think Cao Song actually cared very much about how Cao Cao was spending his time, but I'm certain 
Cao Song did not enjoy hearing about it from his own brother. So he summoned Cao Cao and scolded him before sternly punishing him. But like most children, Cao Cao didn't all of a sudden transform into this model student as this event only made him dislike his uncle. So a plan formed in his head. And the next time his uncle came to visit, Cao Cao made sure to greet his uncle at the doors as he suddenly collapsed to the ground, stimulating the symptoms of a stroke. And seeing this traumatic scene unfold before his very eyes, Cao Cao's uncle quickly ran inside to inform Cao Song and the rest of the household, asking for help. But by the time everyone returned, Cao Cao was already off the ground and looked as fine as ever. And when Cao Song asked Cao Cao about his apparent stroke and his miraculous recovery, Cao Cao acted surprised as he answered, Father, what are you talking about? You of all people know that I had never suffered from such an illness. Uncle must be spreading rumors again about me because he dislikes me. So from that point on, Cao Song stopped listening to his brother's warnings about Cao Cao as Cao Cao went about to continue his leisurely lifestyle in peace. Now, most people like to refer to this story when analyzing the meaning behind Cao Cao's nickname of Aman as A is just this cute sound to add to many nicknames, and Man is the only character that we have to discuss here. Man, in a modern context, means to withhold information or to lie, which as you can see goes fairly well with Cao Cao's childhood story here, and with his reputation for cunning and wit. But unfortunately, this interpretation is incorrect as no family in their right mind would nickname their child a little liar, especially since Cao Cao was quite clever with his ploy and got away with his lies. So instead, we have to turn to what this character actually meant back during the Han Dynasty. And it turns out Man is actually a description of a physical trait. According to Shuo Wen Jie Zi, which is an early version of a dictionary from the Eastern Han Dynasty, Man means that you have small, slanty, narrow eyes, which is as much of a derogatory term in those days within China as it is today outside of China. But like many things with family nicknames, sometimes words like chubby can become cute nicknames to hear from your aunts and uncles, but a terrible thing to hear from your peers. And it's recorded actually by a Wei source, or a source that's close to Cao Cao, that Cao Cao hated this nickname. And certain people at his court, like Xun Yu, who had thought that his achievement of betraying Yuan Shao and helping Cao Cao win the battle of Guandu put himself above the court, often referred to Cao Cao as A Man, and this really ticked Cao Cao off in private. But since Xun Yu did contribute mightily to the victory at Guandu, Cao Cao didn't do too much about it. And the reason why we know so much childhood stories from Cao Cao's youth that includes tall tales as Cao Cao fighting off an alligator and lies to his uncle like such is because there was a book written by a Wu scholar during this time period called Cao Man Zhuan, or the tales of Cao Man, which refers to Cao Cao with his nickname added in there, and it's filled with childhood stories. Now, of course, this source does cast a lot of doubt over the validity of these stories. As one can see, it's very likely a source of propaganda by a foreign kingdom, in this case Wu, to tell stories of Cao Cao's youth that would degrade his character. But since these stories have been told for thousands of years, and it's almost impossible for us to know the true stories of even major historical event that has happened over 1,800 years ago, so clearly, it's impossible for us to say if these tales from Cao Cao's childhood are real or not. But regardless, after 1,800 years of telling these tall tales, they have definitely become canon. And regardless of the validity of these stories, they have played a large role and an important role in cementing our collective impression of Cao Cao for thousands of years. So in another sense, these stories themselves, whether fictional or factual, are also pieces of history, and ones we should definitely value. So with that, we're going to be wrapping up episode 2 of our lore series as we have finished up covering Cao Cao's childhood. 
We will be moving on to Cao Cao's teenage years, where his adventures get even wilder as he explores his budding friendship with Yuan Shao. And as an added bonus, in the next episode, we will also be seeing when Cao Cao first acquired his taste for married women. So come back for episode 3 of our lore series titled Cao Cao and Yuan Shao. So once again, I hope y'all enjoyed this episode, and I'll be seeing you next time. Bye!